Hi everybody, uh, welcome to Fortis and Fide. In this video today, we're gonna to talk about the story of Blessed Justo Ukon Takayama. And uh, there's a lot to the story and I think it's really fascinating, really cool. Uh, so what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna give you guys a summary of his life and then we're gonna dive deeper into his conversion story. Um, because based on the things I'm, I'm learning about him and researching about him, uh, his conversion story is pretty interesting. It's pretty fascinating. So I'm gonna give you guys some insight and some details uh, that you may have not heard before, um, but I just wanted to share with you. Now, I also want to mention this. Uh, there's so much information about Blessed Ukon that I can't possibly do in one video. So maybe in the future, I'll make more videos about different aspects of his life. Um, but before we begin, if you guys enjoy this video, make sure you guys like it, subscribe. And also don't forget, um, I'm also writing a novel based on the life of Blessed Takayama, which will go deeper into many parts of his life. So if you guys are interested in that, just click the link down below. I have a weekly newsletter or I will post you uh, post for you weekly updates on the progress of that book. Now, uh, I'll go ahead and start with the summary of Blessed Takayama. So in the summary of summer of 1587, Chancellor Toyotomi Hiroshi was at the peak of his career after achieving the submission of Kyushu, Japan. On July 24th, 1587, he issued an edict prescribing Christianity marking the beginning of the era of the closed country. One man who resisted was Justo Ukan Takayama, a devout Catholic and loyal servant to Hideyoshi. Ukan's life was characterized by confrontations with authority, where he consistently chose personal liberty over servile submission. Born in 1552, Ukan witnessed the entire Christian century of Japan. Baptized at 11, he faced challenges early on, displaying military prowess at 16, Ukan played multiple roles throughout his life, a political and military leader, an adept tea ceremony master, and an unwavering Christian apostle. His path was marked by confrontations, including a significant one in 1573, when he defended his life against a jealous lord. Ukan's loyalty to, the Christian to Christianity faced its ultimate test in 1587, when Hideyoshi issued an anti-Christian edict. Um, if you guys don't know, Hideyoshi was the man who executed the 25 uh, Japanese martyrs. So that was that was the timeline. Uh, Ukan refused to abandon his faith, uh, leading to his exile. He had previously sacrificed his territories and political ambitions for Christianity during the war between Araki, Murasish, and Oda Nabunaga. And I apologize guys for my, uh, my pronunciation of Japanese. I'm still uh, learning the pronunciations. Um, but the good thing about writing a book is I don't need to pronounce things. I, can, I just write them. So I apologize for my mispronunciation. Uh, after Hideyoshi's death, Ukon's fate became entwined with Tokugawa Iesu. Despite political challenges, Ukon continued his Christian mission, especially during the years in uh, Kanazawa. However, his activities drew attention, and when Iesu ordered the expulsion of missionaries in 1614, Ukon, along with his family and missionaries, sailed to Manila. In Manila, Ukon declined offers of support, choosing a life dedicated to spiritual matters. He lived peacefully for 40 days before passing away on February 3, 1615, at the age of 63. His final words emphasized the importance of standing firm in the Christian faith, marking the end of a life shaped by unwavering principles and resilience in the face of adversity. So that's the summary of Blessed Takayama. And, and, I, and I think it's, it's a good summary, but at the same time, I don't think it does quite justice because um, when you know the full story of this man and all the things he went through, all of the um, the trials he went through and just the the sheer amount of pressure he was facing, um, I think it would, it would be really, really, really cool um, for you guys to know that story, which is why I'm, I'm working on that. Now, I want to dive into uh, the beginning of Ukon's life and particularly what... Um, what caused his conversion, right? Because it's, I, I kind of briefly went over it, but I think it's really cool to know about the story. So before I get into that, to give you guys context, I think for many of us, when we think of samurai, we probably think of movies like The Last Samurai, right? We think of these noble men who were very honorable. Uh, they were defending the innocent. They followed a code of Bushido, which by the way, wasn't invented until much, much later. It was almost written as if uh, that the, the, is written in a way to look at the lives of valiant samurai and make that the standard when they were more like the exception rather than the norm. Most samurais were always betraying each other 
um, as, as you see in Ukon's life, right? Constantly betraying one another, extremely violent, um, and often taking advantage of people based on their status, right? So for Ukon, um, he was raised as any other samurai boy. So he was taught about the, the principles of devotion to one's nation, uh, being physically strong, um, having mental resilience, all those things. And even for children raised in samurai families, uh, they would be exposed to a lot of uh, hardship early on. They would be exposed to death, um, brutal executions. Um, they would learn to go without food and water uh, to become detached from their, their fears, right? Um, and Ukon very much wanted to be a samurai. And one of the people that he respected a lot was his father. Now his father, uh, his name was Hiro no Kami. Um, he was the Lord of Sawa Castle in, in 1563. And he was a vassal of Matsunaga. Now, Matsunaga did not like Christianity. He, he despised it. He thought it was a bad religion. And Hiro no Kami shared the same views. He, he actually went so far as to say that um, he believed that the religion should be, you know, that the missionary should be executed. That, that's what, that was his train of mind. And so Hiro no Kami and, and, and Matsunaga and many of the retainers of Matsunaga wanted to find a way, figure out a way to get rid of Christianity, right? So the only problem is that in their area, the shogun, uh, Yoshitsuru, was favored of Christianity. He liked Christianity and he didn't want it to, he didn't want the missionaries to go. So uh, what Hiro no Kami did, he said like, okay, look, we can't get rid of these Christianary missionaries. Let's give them a trial first. Let's let's see. Let's determine if this this religion is good for the Japanese people. And that was really Hiro no Kami's concern. He thought that um, Christianity was not good for Japan, and um, you know he thought that it was wasn't going to be uh, beneficial to uniting the people. Um, you know, probably more more separating because it's a brand new religion. They already have B Buddhism. Uh, they already have their Shinto religion, their Pan Japanese religion, which is kind of like combi combination, right? So they they believed in that, and then this new religion came in and was starting to, you know, just interfere with that. So Ukon's father said, "Okay, let's let's give a trial," um, but the trial was rigged because what he did is he got two of his friends who were also an very anti-Christian, not open-minded, to invite um, Father v uh, Villela who was somebody who was um, doing a lot of missionary work and brother Lorenzo to come and basically explain the faith, right? So what they did is that they sent a letter to the missionary saying, hey, you know, we're interested in converting, right? Or we're interested. Uh, it's kind of similar to Herod, right? Saying, you know, we're, you know when you find the child Jesus, uh, tell me so I, I, can, I can worship him, right? So the the missionary saw that right through they, they knew that this was the trap they knew that it was going to be probably rigged but uh brother lorenzo who was a half blind japanese man who converted and became a brother said hey you know i'll go i'll go and he was willing to die for his faith he kind of knew that was that was going to happen but um as a man who was greatly had a lot of convictions who was converted by saint francis xavier himself he wanted to go and and uh, explained the faith to Hiro no Kami and, and the people he was around. And when Brother Lorenzo shows up, it's unclear as to what questions Hiro no Kami asked, but what we can ascertain from the sources is that uh, Hiro no Kami was a fervent Buddhist, um, but also a man who was just. He was very fair. Um, even though his intentions in the beginning were not to make this a fair trial, he was a fair man. So he listened and it might have been had something to do with the fact that Brother Lorenzo was um, Japanese, perhaps a former Buddhist, and uh, could explain the faith of Hiro no Kami in so well. And what ended up happening is that Hiro no Kami, after hearing what Brother Lorenzo had to say about um, God's plan for, uh, for salvation for all people to be united, he was greatly moved and greatly touched, right? And I think for him, the reason why, and this is just me, just uh, thinking it through, he wanted, he probably truly wanted to unite Japan and he saw that Christianity is a way to unite all peoples. So he, he probably looked at that and was like, wow, this is actually this answer to the problems that we're having. So he uh, converted on the spot, got baptized, encouraged his friends to do it as well. And they also got baptized. They were also uh, convinced and really, really liked 
um, what Brother Lorenzo had to say. And what happened after that is that uh, uh, Hironokami got a new name. He got the name Dario, right? So Dario means good man. That's what it means. Uh, so he got baptized as Dario. And then immediately he goes, he, he invites uh, Father uh, Villela to his house, uh, or his castle rather. And at the age of 11, Ukan gets baptized. Um, he gets, he's given a new name, Justo, as well as his four other siblings and, uh, and uh, Dario's wife uh, also gets baptized. Now for Ukan, uh, he got baptized at 11, but he didn't really care much for the faith he was given. He was kind of like, um, he was catechized very little. And the reason why is because many of the missionaries and the brothers um, had to leave because of so much uh, just walking on eggshells with the shoguns. Like there'd be, there'd be so many rulers who would be okay with Christianity and then suddenly not, right? Or they get swayed by the, the opinion of someone else. And a very tragic moment for uh, Ukon was when uh, Dario and his family had to flee to Sakai. Now Sakai, the reason why they had to flee is because uh, the former shogun Yoshitsuru, who was favorable of, of the missionaries, uh, got killed by um, people who were working for Matsunaga, right? So they probably saw what Dario did, assuming it was going to go in their way, and it didn't, and it shocked everybody. Uh, so they just like, okay, well, let's just kill the shogun. Let's kill, let's kill the guy who's protecting these missionaries. And, um, you know, so Dario had to flee with, with other missionaries to Sakai. And, you know, they didn't kill anybody, but what they did is they did exile them, right? So that was the, the mercy they were given was not to necessarily get, get killed for their faith, but get exiled uh, to other places. Um, now, when Dario was in Sakai, he served under a retainer of Wada, uh, Koremasa, who was a loyal, he was loyal to the former shogun, Yoshitsuru. So uh, Wada uh, Koremasa was... Uh, in favor of the Christians because of simply that that is that the former shogun Yushitsuru was was also so he kind of uh, took that responsibility of protecting Dario and his family um, and what ended up happening is that uh, Wada Koremasa had a nephew um, named uh, Wada uh, Koranaga now Wada Koranaga uh, he didn't like Christianity he was um, didn't like it now for for Koremasa he loved Christianity and even became a Christian, wanted to become a Christian himself. And um, so what ended up happening is his nephew kills him. His nephew, so Korenaga, I know the names might be confusing. Korenaga kills Korenmasa. So he kills him and wants to kill Takayama and his family as well, wants to kill the Takayama family. So uh, what happened is um, on the night of April 12th, uh, 1573, uh, Korenaga and 15 retainers were gathered in the dining hall of Tatsuki Castle, which is where um, the Ka Takayama family was living. And what happened is in the middle of their festivities, in the middle of uh, having dinner or something, uh, Korenaga attacked uh, Ukon um, and attacked the family. However, um, they wounded Korenaga and he fled from the scene. And what happened is that Korenaga um, also burned down um, the castle that they were staying in. Now, for Ukon, in this in this fight, he got greatly wounded, right? He got wounded so badly um, that he was almost at the point of death. And this was a life-changing moment for Ukon because up to this point, he was very, very much interested in being a, sam a samurai. He longed for battle. And this was his battle. This was his fight. He had to fight Koranaga. And he was greatly injured and wounded by it. So as a result, he couldn't um, be at his full capacity. So in the meantime, in 1574, uh, Father Francisco Cabral uh, visited Ta uh, Tatsuki. And uh, this was very rare for the Japanese because they've been longing for a priest, longing for someone to catechize. And uh, Dario even offered his house uh, for mass and instruction of catechumens. So for Dario, he looked at this as, okay, this is an opportunity to um, teach my son about, uh, to catechize my son. Because that was something he really, he noticed. He was like, I, you know, my son is not taking the faith very well. Um, he doesn't really have a passion for it. But I feel like if he got catechized, um, he would, he would learn better, right? So 
when Father Francisco visited, uh, he offered three kinds of sermons. He offered sermons for uh, the samurai, specifically for wives and for common people. But the samurai sermons were the most popular. So many samurai came uh, to listen to Father Francisco Cabral and ask questions. Now, for Ukon, um, he just came in and he just observed. He, he came in and listened to the sermons and he observed and were very satisfied with Father Francisco's answers. And many, many samurai, you know, after listening to sermons were asking to be baptized. And um, there's a there's a really interesting thing too, where one of the things that, that the, the, the Jesuits were teaching were also spiritual exercises, right? This was spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. And this affected Ukon deeply. And what ended up happening is that he became a zealous apostle in that moment. So he, he learned about the faith and he went on to convert like thousands of people. And, you know, I can't get into that entire story now because, again, this video would be an hour long. And this is why I'm writing a book about it. However, if you guys want a resource on the full life of Takayama Ukon um, and, and with a little bit more detail, um, grace, thanks be to God, this book that I have right here. This one that called, this is where I'm getting a lot of my uh, research from. A lot of things I'm telling you guys comes from this book. Um, and I'm studying a lot of other books too. Like the this one is also called The Catholic Church in Japan. Um, I'm also reading from Sam Sum, History of Japan. Uh, so I'm doing a lot of research on this. And also from uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori, The Martyrs of Japan. So there's a lot of books about uh, this timeline, but there's not too many books about um, Takayama. So thanks be to God, that book that I have, Two Japanese Christian Heroes, is now available on Kindle. Uh, so I checked Amazon and they have it on Kindle now. So if you want to like learn more about Takayama, um, I highly recommend you guys check that book out. I'm not being paid. There's no like sponsored thing in, in, with that link. Just click it and read that book because um, it, it would put you to tears. It put me to tears, uh, especially when you read from the beginning to the end. They even have quotes from Takayama too, which is really rare. Um, so I highly, highly encourage you guys to read that. Now, just to give you guys a little bit of my insight on the story, um, you know, Ukon went from a man who wanted to be a samurai, had all these worldly ambitions, I'm sure. And then all of that was shattered by the fact that he put the samurai like on a pedestal. Now, the reason why I say that is because when children are being raised, based on my research, uh, to become a samurai, they're told of great mighty stories. They're told of like the stories in which samurai would have valiant, um, you know, defeats of their enemy. They would be firm and they'd be strong. They'd be loyal to the shogun. They would have all these different kind of role models. And for Ukon, you know, I, what I believe is that his, his world shattered when, you know, he had to fight uh, for his life, right? And I think for many of us, this is a lesson in which many of the saints went through where they are of the world and then they no longer become of the world. You know, like Saint, um, Saint August, Augustine, or you look at Saint Ignatius of Loyola, which their stories are very similar, right? Uh, he got hit by a cannonball, um, very much wanted to be a war, war hero and then couldn't do that anymore and then became a man of faith in his injury. And I think this is a good lesson for us as well because we might know people who are seeking the world as well. And, and I tell you guys this from a personal experience. The reason why I take Takayama's story to heart is because um, we have things in common. Like at the age of 11, I also was received in the church, which I find really cool. Um, in my 20s, um, my, probably my, my mid 20s, I did have a bad accident in a tournament which caused me to really revert back to my faith and cherish it more. Like I, I had a very similar kind of experience. Um, and, you know, so for, for Blessed Takayama, I think the lesson here is that God loves variety in his saints. Like it is so cool that the fact that we have saints who are, um, you know, all over the world. And this is the beauty of the Catholic church is that there's so many saints from so many different backgrounds, so different kind of flavors of saints. Um, and, and I heard Father uh, Ripperger say it best. It's like, if you want to know, what, you know, you want, you want proof that God loves variety, look at how many bugs there are 
right? Which is true. And that's the same thing with saints. Like there's so many different saints and um, his story is, is quite inspirational. And I want you guys to um, pray for the canonization process. Um, he's very close to being a saint. I believe he has one miracle and he needs one more uh, in order to be canonized. So it's going to happen very soon. And like I said, you guys, if you guys want a full story about Takayama, um, I highly recommend you check out Two Japanese Christian Heroes. It's written by Father uh, Johannes Laris, a Jesuit. Um, and if you guys want updates on my book that I'm writing, my novel, uh, just go ahead and click the links down below. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Uh, blessed Takayama, or a Pronobis. All right, see you all next time.